Okay. Recording in progress. That's right. That's what it said. Right on. That's it. Here we go. <laughs> hey, guys, it's uh, Ray here, uh, the gray-haired guy in a gi. Uh, Tales from the Mat episode. I have no idea. I think it's number 11, maybe. And uh, as you know, we post these now, these particular ones on the uh, Guru Dan and Masano fan page. So uh, I'm very fortunate to have Tim here. And um, I have so many questions and we'll try to go a little bit in chronological order. I have written down here. And nice. This, this podcast, because you're always interviewing other people. and this Yeah, one, it's, it's almost like deja vu because what was it, two weeks ago you and I did the interview for, for my podcast. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. But this time it's, it's about you, but it's also questions okay. that I may have. And obviously... I'm going to try to keep as much politics out of it as possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You said you, you said that with Dwight, too. <laughs> yeah, I did pretty good. Hey, I've you. watched your show. See, I'm watching your show. They're good. I, I appreciate that. Me and Dwight yeah. chatted afterwards. So I just, I because <laughs> for those who don't know, I'm located on the east coast of Canada, Nova Scotia. And all of our information, all the years came from Black Belt Magazine, yeah. And then obviously when the internet and social media. So let's yeah. just say that was a classic internet, time. Yeah. Yeah. It was a classic time. And social media. We got all our info from Black Belt, Karate International, Kung Fu, and all those magazines. So anybody JKD wise, I only know from magazines. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. It's true. So, uh, so real quick, we'll kind of start with what do you do right now? Like, obviously, as in, you are at the Inosano Academy. Like we're going to go back in time to when you started okay. training and stuff. But I know you're soup. You anyway. What do you do? You're there all the time. You're doing things. Hit hit it. Uh, okay. Well, I I'm kind of um, I want to say semi retired from my profession, which was editing television. Oh. So I still do it. Like if projects come to me right now, I'm actually working on a documentary film called In Our Place. And it is the third film done by a producer and director by the name of Antonia Glenn. And Antonia, uh, her family is of Japanese descent or her okay. mother's side anyway. And so she's thematically taken on um, the theme of Japanese Americans and their history in the United States. And uh, she's been... Um, publicly funded by PBS uh, out of Sacramento. So she's gotten grants for the these three projects that she's done. I've edited two of them. So I edited the, the last one that she did, which was called Before They Take Us Away. And then I'm working on the current one for, okay. for her. And uh, her mother, her mother is a PhD in Asian American studies from uh, UC Berkeley. And her mother's like earliest memories are being in the internment camps. Oh. And uh, so they, they've thematically, uh, kind of along these lines. So the, the last one was about self evacuees, which were uh, people in um, California and Oregon and Western Washington who were given the opportunity in a small window, like three days to move away from the communities and get out of the West coast uh, or go to an internment camp. So not oh, all wow. people had that choice. Uh, some people did. And uh, there was a really just great stack of interviews that they had with these folks that were children at the time, but you know, older, obviously, when they were interviewed. Um, that one got a lot of really good reception and, and still got played on PBS, obviously. And then it, uh, a slightly longer version went into festivals. And this one is uh, same idea, but I'm not sure if a lot of people knew that in the United States, a lot of these internment camps, which were kind of all over the West Coast, even in Utah and Arizona and places like that, a lot of them were on Native American tribal land. Uh, and so this one is discussing the intersection between those communities, the Japanese American communities and the Native American communities. So okay. uh, it's they're cool projects. So if I get a project that comes to me that I'm interested in, I'll do that. I'll still do that kind of work. Um, but otherwise, I primarily spend my time with teaching martial art, learning and teaching martial art, and then doing, you know, like the podcast that, uh, that you were on, uh, which is a kind of a larger part of the larger project that is a um, more modern day spin on a magazine. So, you know, right. print magazines are kind of out. So I'm looking at how do you take multimedia, uh, which is fortunately an area of expertise for me, 
and um, was put martial art content out. So awesome. uh, just trying to take all my areas of knowledge and throw them together. And, yeah, you uh, talk to so many people, I mean, <laughs> you know, of all different styles and everything. And yeah, that's just wonderful. So yeah, I loved it. Good for you. How long I have you like been meeting doing that? people? Uh, the podcast will be going into its third year. So I, I started releasing them in December of 2022. And so uh, we did all of 2023, all of a little bit that was in 2022 and all of 2023, I called season one. So once 2024 started, I call this season two that we're in now. And then uh, 2025 will be season three of it. So wow. we've done quite a few. I'm coming up, um, getting ready to record episode 100. That'll be coming up soon. Uh, I forget. I just recorded one this morning with Sean Snow out of um, St. Louis. I, I don't know what number that is. I'd have to go look. But I know number 100 is coming up as far as recording. And I've got a pretty good guest lined up for that one. Okay. That's awesome. That's yeah. Awesome. And just so <laughs> just my just so people know who maybe who are watching this, I'm in my wife's treatment room. That's why it looks so good behind me. Because people yeah, are, it looks cool. the swords and the Bruce Lee posters yeah. and the video games. But my oh, wife look- does... Uh, she trains and she teaches Reiki and sound healing. Oh, okay. And a bunch of other. Yeah, I was going to say, holistic... that looks more like physical therapy type stuff. Yes. That looks, so yeah, that's she good. has I a love clinic it. here in our home. And well, we only have a small home, but um, so that's where I'm at because it's nice. <laughs> well, that's cool. Yeah. So, that's pleasant. Um, I like it. This is just part of it. So, anyway, where are you from originally? Because obviously you live in Los Angeles or California. Oh, where are you from okay. Originally? I'm, uh, I was actually born here in the Los Angeles area. Oh, in, I see. Uh, October of 1969. So my birthday's coming up. I'll be 55 here in a couple oh, of weeks. Okay. Um, my parents are from Illinois. Uh, dad was from Peoria, Illinois. And my mother was from Moline, Illinois. And that area is kind of called Quad Cities, that Moline and all that. Peoria is about 90 miles southeast of there. And Peoria is kind of known for being middle America back in the day. Like if you okay. think of Mad Men and the ad agency, when they... Uh, would test things in what they called middle America, the center of population at that time was Peoria, Illinois. And so there, there became this saying, which was, if it plays in Peoria, it'll play anywhere. Uh, so that's where my, my father's from. And also is the type of nondescript accent that they wanted on everyone from a broadcaster to, you know, like radio guy, TV guy or whatever. So that's why, right. Most radio people end up kind of sounding like me with what we say, no discernible accent, because that was, again, middle America. Um, but interesting place. Richard Pryor was actually from there at the same time as oh, my okay. dad. Oh, <laughs> yeah. very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so, then, uh, uh, it, okay, so let's go to the beginning. So I grew up there. So anyway, yeah, so I was I was born here. Uh, they lived out here. They were working for Howard Hughes Aircraft Company at the time. Oh, yes. Yep. And then... Um, by my third birthday, because I remember my third birthday, they had moved back to Illinois. I'm not ever, it was never clear on the reason why they went back. I think it had, because Vietnam War was still going. So I don't think it was, they were laid off or anything like that because Hughes was still going. But one thing that had happened the summer before I was born was the Manson family murders. Right. So like the Sharon Tate murder and all that stuff. And apparently that outfit was hiding out in the hills near Simi Valley, which is where I was born. So it may have been just more like they got a little freaked out about stuff like that and said, well, let's go back to Illinois where we don't really have Charles Manson. (laughs) I think the Charles Manson murders were on the same day as my wife's birthday. Oh, really? Wow. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They were on the, she (laughs) just said, yeah, yes, they were. Cause she often reminds me of that. So uh yeah wow anyway that's wow there's <laughs> so i mean so, to, to answer your question born in california raised in Illinois. okay i see so when did you first start your get your love for martial arts or when was your first sort of introduction to oh, any martial arts? gosh i don't remember not knowing about it so okay. it's like as a kid i i always remember and i think it was the kung fu tv series yeah because yeah. that was on i remember seeing it as a kid and I remember, I think it's first grade when you start taking your lunch to school. I had a Kung Fu lunchbox, Kung Fu series <laughs> lunchbox. Don't you wish you still so, had it? It'd be worth nothing. Oh, my God. That would probably be worth some <laughs> serious bucks. But, uh, yeah, so, uh, so I I knew about it as early as 
first grade. So that's, you know, some of my earliest memories is, is knowing of martial arts through media, through movies and television. I remember seeing the movie Black Belt Jones probably mm-hmm. in first grade because cable television, you know, was coming out. And right. I remember that being on cable television and just thought that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. Is that Jim <laughs> Kelly? Yeah, Jim Kelly. Jim Kelly. Yeah. Rest in soul. Rest in soul, I guess. Rest in soul. Exactly. Rest in peace. Yeah. Rest in peace. <laughs> it's Friday. And so I, I had a drink or two before this thing. So. All right. Yeah, <laughs> I should have poured one. No, uh, you feel free yeah. if someone can bring you one. <laughs> <laughs> it's no problem. It's almost almost within our arm's reach. I got some good scotch over there. Well, do what you got to do. Um, but yeah. anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt you. So, Oh, no worries. Uh, so, I mean, I, I really started around uh, middle school. So the summer after my seventh grade year of school, I started martial arts. That was um, 1982 mm. when I started. And... It kind of boiled down to, I think at that point, finally, just accessibility. I think also my parents going, well, okay, you're at an age that you probably actually take it seriously right. to do. And then the other thing was um, I was independent enough. And I mean, this is also kind of a product of the time and the place that I literally could get myself to the lessons. I'd ride my bike or whatever, okay. um, take the bus. And I ended up, I was paying for it myself too. I actually had a paper route. So my dad nice. paid for the first summer for me. I was like, he paid for three lessons up front. I got the uniform with it. So it was one of those kind of cool deals. And then from that moment on, I paid for it myself, actually. Wow. And this was in California, correct? This was in Illinois. Illinois. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you, what did, do you remember what you got involved with first? Oh, sure. Yeah. It was um, Shorinru Karate. Okay. And my teacher, uh, Ulysses Owens, who I talked to this day, just phenomenal oh, man nice. such a uh, you know um, i want to say person who is very much motivated me uh very much someone i looked up to or still look up to just lovely person he was a pka trainer and competitor okay. in that day too yeah. so the school had all of these people who were amateur and professional fighters as well so I started in the summer and the first thing, you know, it's like they had morning class. Great. I get down there nine o'clock in the morning. And the first thing is this kickboxing class. Yeah. And, they, and I'm 12 years old and they throw me right in there. And here I am with these grown adults who are fighters and they have a spar as a warm up. I'm thinking I've not even done any of this. Yeah. And the first person I spar with is his wife. Well, his wife had fought five or six professional fights at the time. Her previous fight, she'd knocked out the Canadian champion. So she was ranked number one in the world. Wow. And she just like punched me right in the chest. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> this is like very real. <laughs> and that was, you know, in, in the, I guess the golden era of North American kickboxing was like oh, yeah, late yeah. 70s, 80s. But it was in prime. Right. North America. I started North American kickboxing as a teen. Yeah, yeah. I, think I mean, it's all the big four. names like. Bad Brad Hefton and yeah. uh Yanni Terrio from, oh, yeah, from Canada. I remember him yeah. really well. Yeah, he so was many, so a, many great a favorite. Don yeah. Wilson, so Don many. Wilson and so Anthony many. Amp Elmore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tony Palmore. Um uh Bob Thurman. Bob Thurman and Terrio had a really like good fight. I remember oh, that. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was sure a really did. good one. It's a good golden era of kickboxing. And Joe Lewis had made a comeback at 40 at that point. So Joe oh. Lewis was fighting. Okay. At that time. Is that his, he didn't, it, that wasn't his match he did with Bill Wallace like that. He did like. No, that was like a, that's when they did, I want to say early nineties at that okay. point. That was like a, a thing, but no, this was him actually making a comeback into the PKA. Wow. And I, I want to say he was upper thirties or 40. And it was always, cause you're like, Oh, cool. Joe Lewis. Because Joe Lewis had also been a Shorinru guy okay. under the same master who had taught my karate master. So yeah, you know, he Joe Lewis was a name. Over in Okinawa. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Joe Lewis was a name we knew and admired, obviously. So, you know, when he was doing kickboxing, he was on ESPN. We made sure we watched. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, okay. So um, you were with Shorinru karate for quite a while. And then you decided. Yeah, 10 years. And, it, and then. So then you ended up moving to California or, or I did right after high school. I moved to California okay. for uh, a couple of years and kind of went into the workforce and started going to college part time. 
Right. And then um, just financial situation. Basically, I kind of was working for a contractor who had personal problems and <laughs> didn't pay me for a while, right. put me in some financial issues. So I, I went back oh, to man. Illinois briefly and then ended up um, getting involved with who was my first wife. And we moved, she and I moved to Florida uh, to be around her father, uh, which is the Tampa area. And so once I got settled, I'm like, okay, I want to get back into studying martial art again. Mm-hmm. I was training on my own, but you know, I'm like, it's always good to be, in my opinion, I like being either in a group or in a school where you have training partners and stuff pretty regularly. And I was looking around and going, okay, there's no Sean Rue guy. There's really no, I couldn't really find kickboxing per se, uh, at least not in that way, anywhere close. And I thought, well, going to have to try something new. Let me look around. You know, I was looking at uh, Kempo guy. And then I, uh, you know, I Segal's films with Aikido was popular. I'm like, maybe I can try that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, but a lot of stuff, it was just, you know, when you're looking for things, there's, there's the uh, opportunity meets, you know, your ability to get to it. Sure. Kind of absolutely. So, yeah. So there I ended up looking, um, do you remember back in the day there was like, free newspapers they'd put out that would have all the information about like entertainment going on during the oh, weekend. Oh, yes, yeah, we'd have them here bit. too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in the Tampa area, there was one and I remember just perusing the ads in the back and I found a guy that was JKD and oh. Polly and I'm like, well, wait a second. There's something I've always wanted to try because like you, I was a big avid reader of all the magazines. So even though I didn't practice all these different arts. I knew who the players were. I knew what the arts were, you know, everything and anything I could read, I did. And so I knew what JKD was. I knew what Kali was. I knew who Dan was, you know, I knew all, all the players, yeah. like you said, through the, the magazines. magazines. Yeah. Through the magazines. Exactly. So I called this guy and he was like, Oh, I'm training at this community center. And I'm like, Oh, right. JKD backyard. Right. You know, this, this sounds authentic. <laughs> So I called a guy and he calls me back uh, and his name is Lauren Bookbinder. And he, he ended up being my first teacher in all this. He's about five years older than me. So when he called, we just kind of hit it off because we were close in age. We had a lot of the same music tastes and whatever. And it was a little farther than what I was initially wanting to go. So because I lived on, uh, if you kind of know, the Tampa, St. Petersburg area. Basically, you have a peninsula that goes out where St. Petersburg is. Then you have Tampa Bay. Uh, right. On the west side of St. Petersburg is the Gulf of Mexico. So you have the Gulf of Mexico, the uh, Pinellas County uh, Peninsula, then Tampa Bay, then Tampa proper. So he was in Tampa proper by USF, which is kind of on the far side, north, say like northeast side. So it was a bit of a jaunt for me, but I'm like, you know what? This might be worth it. Let me go check it out. So I drove over with a guy who was a friend of mine at the time. Uh, who had done some martial art. He's like, I'll check it out with you. We'll go. And so we went and I watched it and I'm like, yeah, this is, this is the stuff I want to do. This is pretty cool. And again, got along with the instructor very well. And I'm like, well, okay, it's a little bit of a drive, but whatever. And so I just started training with him. And then, Fantastic. you know, there you go. Plug me into this family and now you can't get rid of me. <laughs> ah, there you go. There you go. So I know that, you know, the, what everybody likes to hear about is, um, your first introduction to Guru Dan and Asano. Oh, okay. So my teacher, Lauren, he studied with Guru. And you heard about this from John Maidmont. Because John Maidmont went and did this thing too, which was the Aspen Academy of Martial Arts yes, in the 70s right. Very in famous. Colorado. Exactly. So Lauren had studied there too. And he was a young teenager. So he went and was literally like camping in the woods doing this for a couple of the years and he basically i think the first year he went and then because i think guru had like a, a beginning group and an advanced group so he ended up being able to get into both so he oh, was wow. hanging out there and training like eight hours a day so in both of the four hour sections right and so he had this very intense you know training for a few years and then you know he was and his dad was kind of a i think relatively known Shotokan teacher something that was always kind of running school so he got plugged into different things over time and um so you know he's kind of plugged into the martial arts scene yep. and all this and he was kind of before i think a lot of the certification was going on because he never really had any certification 
but I wasn't overly worried about that. That was oh, never yeah, something for sure. that concerned Back me. I was just interested training. in the training. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I ended up finishing my university at the University of Miami in Florida there and uh, was, again, getting into television. So, okay, well, where do you go to do that? You'd go back to L.A., of course. And I'd always kind of want to come back here anyway. It just kind of feels like birthright. I love the, the climate here and everything. Right. So after graduating, came back out this way and, uh, you know, I tried to work, get myself into a career. And once that sort of got settled, uh, settled to where I'm like, okay, I've got a schedule. I was like, let me find someone who's certified under Guru Dan so I can continue doing the things I was doing. I had always assumed he was farther south in uh, Torrance because it seems like every time you'd see something it would say Kali Academy Torrance. Inno Santo okay. Academy Torrance or something like that. So Torrance is um, not far, but if there's traffic, it's far enough. Okay. And I thought, let me go to their website. I'll see if I can find someone close. I didn't pay attention to the address of the academy, but I found an instructor who was literally at the end of the block at the time of where I live. And I thought, cool. And it was Ray Copeland. And I'm like, well, let me go down here. Well, Ray was never open when I was available. And I'm like, damn it. So I can't study with this guy. So let me go back to the website. Let me see if there's another person somewhat close. Then I paid attention to the address. And I'm like, wait, Marina Del Rey, I'm in Santa Monica. That's three miles from me. Uh, let me just go Monica. there. Uh, yeah. So that's how that worked. I just like, well, I'm just going to go to the place. Yeah. And uh, I called and um, Dory had said, oh, well, you can come in and you can at the time you could watch a class. Then you could try one. And then if you wanted to sign up, you could. So I'm like, well, okay, well, cool. You'd, be, you'd have to watch a class first. So kind yeah, of now edit. adult wise, they won't let you try one for free. I think you can come right. watch one, but they won't let you try it. Because that, that probably got abused, I'm sure, by somebody. Oh, yeah, so, so much. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but, but at the time, and then they had just moved from the uh, Westchester location on Manchester Boulevard to Santa Monica, uh, not Santa Monica, but Marina. So the location they're in now, they this had one. just moved there. Oh, I, I see. Okay. There. So they'd been there probably. That's the only one months. I've ever been to. So right. the other ones I've right. only seen in magazines. and. Pictures. Yeah, yeah. Same here. I've seen them on video. Well, I, I saw the location. I'd driven by it. And then the location before that, the one that Brandon Lee was at, yeah. was literally across Glencoe. So where it sits now is between Glencoe and Redwood. So if you went down beach, went across uh glencoe the old one was right there so it's like two minute three minute walk from where the new one the one wow. is now but it's gone it's like that and the manchester one are both gone because you know they knock things down and put apartment buildings yeah there. so yeah so the last two locations are not physically there anymore though the the land is obviously right um but yeah so it was kind of cool I, I went in uh to watch and was, i was working uh for e entertainment network at the time editing uh, some of the long form shows like true Hollywood story and that sort of thing. Okay. And I was uh, working perfect. evening time. And so my daytimes are free. So I had gone in for a Thursday morning class and I have no idea who teaches what or anything like that. I'm just like, Oh yeah, I'll go watch a class. So Thursday morning class and your dance teaching it. Wow. So, you know, you, you know how it is. This is like the Beatles to us, right? Oh yeah. So you're just like, Oh my God, here, here he is. Live what in age range was great. he about then? Uh, this is 20 years ago. So he was late sixties. Oh wow. Wonderful. Yeah. So I've been there 20, yeah, about 20 years this year. Yeah. Cause Amazing. they've been in the location 20. Amazing. So it's my 20th year there. So uh, he had, uh, yeah, he was late 60s and just, I mean, amazing. Everything you kind of expect. Yeah. Uh, but the accessibility wasn't something I expected. And I was like, wow, okay. I'm like, this class is open for anyone to do? Because I assumed it would be like any martial arts school where you would go, you would train with other instructors till you Yeah, like his would be sem super, super, super private. And you right. have to be invited by 25 or maybe five people. Yeah, exactly. Take a blood oath and, you know, right, right. that stuff. <laughs> and I think nothing of that. That's, you know, I've got no problem with that. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a perfectly fine thing. So I was, I was actually quite pleased to see that he was teaching a course that was sort of open and it was an FMA uh, class. So it was kind of cool to watch. And the best part is I'm thinking, okay, this is cool. I can do this. And my instructor taught me pretty well because I'm not lost in anything that they're doing oh. that I'm seeing. And then, 
class ends and I'm sitting in chairs that are actually by his office. Well, he comes just walking over and I'm like, oh my God, he's walking right at me. What's going on? What's going on? And he goes, hi. And I'm like, hi. <laughs> you know, like, wow. Okay. <laughs> and then he goes in his office. And so I went to Dory and I said, yeah, I said, I'd love to, to try this out. And so I was also just trying to clear up my schedule of other things. So my mornings would be completely open. So I said, I'll come back next Thursday and try this class. So that particular Thursday, Guru was gone somewhat, probably seminar or whatever. And uh, Victor Granjano was teaching the class and it was pretty cool. So I jump in there and I'm, you know, moving around and Vic kind of goes, hey, you're not new. You're new to here, but you're not new to this. I said, don't know. And I told him a little bit of my background. He goes, great. So we worked a bit and we became just pretty good friends you know, because of that. Uh, it was really nice of him to sort of recognize that. And so I really enjoyed it. And I told Dory, I said, okay, I'll sign up. I said, I'll come back. I said, I'm busy tomorrow. Uh, they had Friday morning classes at the time. And I'm busy Saturday this week, but I'll be back Tuesday. They had a Tuesday morning class. And she said, okay. She goes, I won't be here. There'll be a lady named Deborah to help you. I said, okay, great. So I come in on Tuesday morning and there's a lady named Deborah there to help me. And she said, um, Class will start here in 15 minutes. If you want to go stretch out, you can. All right. So I walk on. At the time, um, it was when you were here, it was, was the tiger mats down, all the blue tiger mats? Um, or was it like a puzzle mat? My wife will know what year I went there. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. I can't remember. I can't remember the year I went to. But, but you didn't see just concrete. 2012. Floor, right? Oh, okay. So I uh, we probably had the puzzle mats at that point yeah so it was more yeah, like they uh, didn't the, have the judo mats, mats like the titan yeah 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 got it okay so before that uh going out from the sort of rope in the back yeah. to almost where that first set of poles is was a wrestling mat oh I after see. that it was nothing but a concrete floor oh and there was like circles and triangles so that's kind of what it was like so i i went took my shoes off sat on the wrestling mat and was stretching out and I could see there was a guy sitting back where I had been sitting the one day. So he's sitting close to Guru's office. And I, again, I'm not like one to stare at people or anything like that. Right. I was just stretching out, whatever. So time came for class to start. And I saw this person get up, they walk, they come around and they come to the front of the class. And I'm looking at him like, oh my God, this is Larry Hartzell. I didn't know that he taught me. Wow. And wow. so the first class I ever paid for and signed up for, Larry Hartzell taught. I mean, he quite quickly did the same thing. He looked at me and said, okay, you're new here, but you're not new to this. I said, no, sir. I said, yeah, I've been doing, I get kind of gave him my history and he goes, okay, that's really good. So about the third time I came in after that. So he taught Tuesday morning. So it was like two more Tuesdays later, Deborah, who was Deborah Hartzell says, Larry's opening up the semi-private group and he would like to invite you to it if you'd like to join it. And I'm like, ah, uh, Yes. Yeah. Like, you could tell me it was $10 million. I don't care. Wow. I'm going to find a way to get the money to do that. Yeah. So I was really lucky that pretty early on, I got to kind of get into Larry's semi-private group as well. So that was like a Monday morning for two to three hours. The Tuesday what would you morning. Typically, I'm keeping an eye on. We got still got lots of time, but yeah, no worries. so many questions I want to ask you, but I don't <laughs> have like, I have like an hour and a half, but what typically yeah. would he teach? Larry Hartzell? Yeah, like whatever um, he wanted or? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, he was truly what you would call uh, mixing the arts because right. it, he really taught by range. That's about the best way to say. Oh. So if we were doing kickboxing range, we did kickboxing no matter yeah. what it was. We'd punch, kick, knee, and elbow, yeah. whether it was Muay Thai, Junfan, Fan, uh, Savat, didn't really matter. Yeah. Uh, a kick is a kick to us. So we're going to use Chasse. We're going to use uh, uh, Chuck Tech. We're going to use a Muay Thai round kick. We're going to use a fuete. You know, it didn't, didn't really matter uh, on on the style. You know, if you wanted to finish a guy with a shin kick, you did. Right. You know, if you okay. wanted to tap Amazing. and move around like Savat, you could. Uh, when we moved into trapping range, we used, you know, John Fon trapping. We used the collie. We used the sea lot for the takedowns and the grappling. He like, just did what he, just, what, like what he liked. Just what Exactly. He liked. Beautiful. Yeah, and when it comes Perfect. to his grappling now, you know, I've got all of his notes. I'm figuring out now what all of his stuff was a combination of realizing he had more sea lot in there than I ever realized. Oh, okay. 
too. Yeah. I mean, he was a really good CLAT player. And then he was one of Edgar Salite's students. So, you know, we did, we did a lot of collie with him, a lot of stick work and knife work as well. And he was really good at that. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. And our sessions were two, three hours at a time. So we did everything. We really did take time to kind of do everything. We did a lot of hoo as well. Wow. So, um, and then, of course, you just continue training and you're going there. How yes. do you go there a couple times a week? And Oh, God. every uh, So when I was working uh, nighttime, what I would do is we had Tuesday. Well, I'd be there Monday because Larry, training with Larry. So I'd be there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday with Larry. And then on Thursday, I would be there for Guru's class in the morning. And then there was an MMA class at, at noon taught by Atticus Todd, who's one of my closest and dearest friends. And then there was two Friday morning classes, one taught by uh, Justin Williams and one taught by Elaine Renault. I went to those. And then there was Saturday classes all day and I would go. Wow. So the, what's that? Six days? Six days a week? Yeah. <laughs> and then <laughs> I remember when I was there in 2012, I watched they had a children's class, which yeah. was nice to see. They have a children's class back then or? That, you know, I'm not sure because I didn't have kids. Yeah. And um, you probably weren't there. Don't, they like, did not show up at the time. Have one. Yeah. If they had one, it might have been at the same time. The Saturday one is not, at nine o'clock now. Maybe I came in at 10. I just don't remember whether there was kids right. leaving or not. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I teach that nine o'clock kids class now on Saturday now. Okay. But, um, but yeah, I want to say because I've seen little dragons photos that go back quite a ways yeah because when i was there teaching. so they've had it it might have been a saturday morning it had to be because kids were there in the morning but yeah uh, jeff yamada was teaching and guru dan was teaching oh wow the kids maybe jeff yamada i hope i pronounced his name correctly um he was there anyway and so yeah uh, I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe, of course, that they were there, but I also couldn't believe these young Well, at that time, he probably had a little girl in the class. She's not so little now. She's a college, almost a college graduate. That's probably what it was. (laughs) And uh, I just was watching the kids because I I really enjoy teaching children's programs. I've been doing it for a long time. Just watching the kids and just, I was like, wow, if they only knew what their, the history and what they're learning. Oh, yeah. I, I try that with them. So I, I give on Saturday, I give them homework a lot right. of times okay. uh, and it's stuff like you need to find out by next week, find out one of Sifu Dan's instructors in FMA. Yeah. And it's always stuff that they can either find in the room or what I encourage them to do is go ask him, go talk to him because what I want them to do is have a memory when they're older, when they realize who he was in the larger picture. Of yeah. They actually have a memory interacting. That's amazing. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And you do a lot of, I do a lot of <laughs> games with the kids. We have you yes. know, wrestling games, judo games. It just, I mean, I teach adults too, but uh, I don't know. I love just teaching the kids. It's just so much fun. Oh yeah. Yeah. We got, uh, we got a Halloween party obviously coming up because Halloween's coming up. Yeah. And uh, I've got, if kids could give Yelp reviews, we would have the best Yelp review for our uh, <laughs> kids party, Halloween party. One kid's like telling the other kids, this is the best party I've ever been to. Been, you know, for the last three years. Like, yeah, there wow, you go. Okay. There you go. I always say with the adults, you know, a lot of times they can be very critical. They want everything too fast. They want to know, where did you learn this? And what's your lineage? And blah, blah, blah. And will this work in the yeah. speed? And blah. But kids, they just want to train and have a good time. They just want to have fun. That's yeah, true. So yeah. it's, it's, it's a joy teaching them, but so that the Inasano Academy offers so many programs or they, they, over the years they've run, they've run so many programs. Did you particularly enjoy all the styles or was there ones you kind of gravitated towards mostly? Oh my gosh. So that, that's a, that's a really good question. And I, I've noted that you've asked John that and you've asked Dwight that as well. So I wanted to try everything. Because, you know, when you start and you understand what Guru's approach is and, and, the, and he's someone that you trust. So when he's looking at an art, you go, OK, I trust that he's looking at this. So I want to look at it, too. I want to see what the, the value is. And one of the things that's really interesting that 
Uh, Joy Morana brought this up to me the other day in a message, and I've said this too. There's been a weird loss of a discussion and a principle that was really popular in the 90s, which was the idea of you don't box a boxer, you don't kick with a kicker, you don't wrestle a wrestler, and you don't trap with like a Wing Chun guy. So the reason why we look at different things is we want to build a reasonable skill in all areas. We right. might specialize in one, but if I get with a guy who's a better boxer than me, I want to wrestle that guy. I want to kick him or I want to use trapping on him. Right. And for some reason, that conversation got lost a long time ago, and I'm not sure why. I still find it as a very important governing principle. Sure. And what I saw with what's offered is things that will make you strong in all of these areas. Right. So, yes, you can pick things that might be um to your liking more than others uh, for me i had not had the chance when i came to the academy to do c lot much before so i was infinitely curious about it so i dived into that i had not been able to do shuto or a lot of grappling before, mm. so i definitely tried shuto class i definitely tried brazilian jiu-jitsu was a little hard because they didn't have it during the daytime but the cool thing was a lot of the mma teachers would stick it in the MMA class. And then obviously I was training with Larry. So mm -hmm. I was getting a lot of sort of mixed grappling. Uh, and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is still something I want to take a deeper dive into. Mm -hmm. um, but so I enjoyed doing all these things that I had never tried before. So that was fun. Obviously, I enjoyed the things that I was already doing. Obviously, I started in kickboxing as a kid. So you throw any kickboxing at me, I'm going to like it. Yep. The Kali was so much fun. And then, you know, the Jun Fan and the JKD material is, is kickboxing and trapping. So trapping was kind of new and it was cool. I liked it. You know, it started making me understand what I saw in Enter the Dragon. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I, I, I wouldn't say there was anything that I said, oh, I, I like this and I don't like that. As I developed, I'm like, this is all, and I'll get myself in trouble. This is all the same. It's all one big Venn diagram. It's all a bunch of overlapping circles where one stops, the other one has already overlapped and is picking up. Yeah. You know, it's like you see a lot of crossover. Let, let's say if I start with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, there's not striking in it, it, in the sport aspect of it anyway, but there's a lot of moves that are the same and principles are the same as C lot for the grappling and throwing aspects of C lot. Well, the way nice. we do C lot with Guru Dan is he puts it on a Southeast Asian kickboxing platform. So now your grappling moves into your kickboxing because of that, but then your kickboxing moves into, you now know Muay Thai or you're familiar with Muay Thai. And if you're doing kickboxing, you can now easily go into the Jun Fan material. You know, it's funny you said that. It's, too. It, it's, yeah. it's so funny you said that because just the other day when I was teaching class, I'm just a blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but in our little club we have, we have black belts that come in to help us. But per, a couple nights a week, it's just blue belts and white belts. So we're just kind of helping each other. But there's a few different techniques. So someone's got you in cross body, you know, you hip scape out and turn, mm -hmm. put your knee up. But I'm like, for you guys who don't know what I'm doing, just do your Muay Thai knee. It's pretty much very yeah. similar to the same move. <laughs> if we're standing up, you throw your Muay Thai knee this way. But if you're laying right. on your back and you turn on your side, you do the same thing. So you could, anyway, it's hard to explain. No, no, 100%. Me, but... It's like, you know, um, so, but Brazilian Jiu Jitsu people that are like, I'm what? Sorry. What? What are you talking about? Yeah. You know, like, yeah, exactly. striking, you know, you can, they're very similar. Oh, big time. You know, it's like uh, Gary Padilla, who's the head of the Jiu Jitsu program at the academy, does a really awesome camp every January. And he'll bring in, I mean, John Jock's actually teaching at it now, mm. but there's like Mark Arm Armstrong and Jay Zabellos will come in. So these are top John Jock black belt guys. Yeah. They're all phenomenal. And like when they get talking, when they start talking about principles and do this, I'm like, dude, you're talking about Wing Chun, <laughs> but you're doing it with your legs. And it's right. like, okay, I totally get this principle. So it's just, you know, the only thing that's confusing to me is just a switch. I need to turn it from this plane to this plane, essentially. Yeah. So I, you know, you, you say not to talk about politics, but, you know, one of the things we keep seeing is people going, how do you guys not get confused? I'm like, I don't know how you get confused. 
Exactly. This isn't in the beginning. Yeah. Okay. If you're trying to do a bunch of these things at once, you, you are looking at it as separate things But eventually, you know, to me, the daily decrease when we talk about that is the lines of division, not the physical technique. Right. So Christopher Harley, who's one of my dearest friends from the Academy, we always say, we like to refer to as martial art, singular, not plural. Martial arts is a nice way to honor culture, but martial right. art, it's all one thing. It's all about body movement and yeah. combat. Good point. And even like when people ask, oh, is JKD, you know, or Bruce Lee the father of mixed martial arts? I'm like, well, of course not. Warfare was the father of mixed martial arts. Exactly. I mean, if you're in warfare back in the day and you've got a sword and you drop it, are you going to call timeout and stop fighting? No. Right. If you get tackled to the ground while trying to pick up your sword, you're going to go, oh, sorry, we don't grapple. No, you're going to grapple. Yeah. I mean, it just got... At one point, someone threw this. a rock at someone and figured, right. hey, that hurts, yeah. you know, or if I hit you with a stick, that hurts. But if I poke you with a sharp stick, right, it'll exactly. go inside you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, they all started mixed. Yeah. And we, we unmixed them because of advancements in warfare where you don't necessarily need certain things but you want to keep skill sets and plus we like sports we're gonna just and we like exactly. fighting each other for play so of course we're going to create sport versions of these things so we don't maul and murder each other but we can still practice and have fun and compete yeah that's why I always find it funny when I run into like, a, say uh, I use the term traditional martial artists, maybe they just do Taekwondo or karate or gym, right. And they don't think about or look at any other martial art. And that's, that's perfectly cool. No problem. But I'm like, but I love all martial arts. Like I love right, martial right. arts. So why would you not look at other styles? But no, nope, they just like what they do. And that's, that's cool too. <laughs> but I feel they're missing out on so much if you, you know, just. Yeah. Yeah. There's so I mean, much... I, I've, I've met those people too, that are strict martial artists. And, and I, in one way I get the idea of, okay, I'm culture in an art form yeah. and that's great. They're looking to perfect it. But at some point, if you're going to go beyond art and you're going to move into combat and movement, you've got to just strategically know about other things. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that's the analogy Guru always uses football. He goes, you know, they don't yeah. they don't just practice against their own defense. They practice against the defensive setups that the other team is going to use. That's right. <laughs> because yeah. that's what they're facing. <laughs> yeah. So, um, oh, man, we'll have to do a part two down the road someday because I do. OK, yeah, no, I'm happy to, of course. We still got time, but um <laughs> I'm going to go off topic here, though, so because oh, I really like talking about do. Guru Dan as well. So and I do have a couple semi politic questions for you, but the real the real All gentle right. ones for everybody watching. <laughs> but um, less calorie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what uh, for someone who hasn't never been to a Guru Dan seminar, what would be your very quick explanation of what to expect? Um. Okay, if you've ever seen uh, the civil rights, um, uh, like, protests and riots back in the 60s when they turn a fire hose on a guy, that's basically what it's like. Knowledge is, uh, Guru Dan's the guy with the fire hose, the knowledge is the water coming out, and you'll be the guy holding on to the wall. Right, right. <laughs> yes, that's um, what I found back in 93 yes. when I took my first seminar. I was like... Basically in a corner crying. No, I'm not going to learn every <laughs> single move he just taught in the two days I was here. <laughs> right. You know. Yeah. Metaphorically, yeah. that's what it feels like. But what I would say is expect to really have an amazing experience because yeah. what you're going to see is arguably one of the best martial arts instructors in the history of it there with him. You're also going to see and, and feel the vibes of an incredibly generous, warm, and friendly person who really desires uh, for you to learn. Yeah. Uh, he is, it's utmost important for him to spread this knowledge out. Um, the hard thing to 
deal with, especially if you're in the, in the beginning stages of it, is there's going to be so much information. And the reason for that, any given seminar and any given class at the academy will be the same. You're going to have this wide range of people from the person there on day one right. to, you know, like Jeff Imada will step into our class and you go, okay, well, now you've just put the average at a senior level instructor yeah. in the class, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it it will... And he will go to an average and the average may be way above your head, Sure, but don't fret because what he does is logical. And it's, if you can't see the larger picture at some point, you will, right. uh, he, what he does is he gives you things that lead to the next thing. And he also mm-hmm. does repeat things. So it's not like if you don't get it this time, don't panic. It's not gone forever. Plus the nice thing is there's a lot of people who are his students who are very good teachers out there doing the thing too. Yeah. And even at the seminars, there's always someone with experience that you know, yeah. kind of offer some advice and stuff like that. Absolutely. Uh, is, it, is it acceptable for someone who has maybe very little experience in a seminar like that to take part of it and then go, uh, now I'm going to watch for a little bit? Or do you think that would be rude? No, I think that's okay. My, my brain is so full that I can't absorb anything else. No, I think that's okay. Uh, yeah, there was a, a, somebody opinion. came into class that way. There was uh, it was two two ladies, and I was helping out one, and the other was I think John might have been helping out the other actually. And the lady working with me about ten minutes into it, she goes, "Okay, my brain's really full right now." Yeah, it was her first time doing anything, and the the friend had done some stuff before. So she did. She's like, I'm going to just sit down and kind of watch. I said, yeah, that's no problem. I said, if you want to jump back in at any point, just holler at me. So I'm going to go help these other two guests that are here at the moment. I said, but just holler at me and I'm happy to come help you. Right. Because sometimes, you know, uh, doing and then observing sometimes helps. It's like, you know, if you ever get injured, sometimes it's good. It's a good time to go take notes because yeah, you're going to sit yeah. down and you're going to watch. And at, you can't at, participate. At yeah, and especially once or twice at his seminars on the second day, especially if he's doing like a really sort of complicated stick drill. I'm like, yeah. oh, maybe the person I'm with, you know, I can't help you, man, because I'm so I'm overloaded right now. Right. I just might take notes or I try to, you know, watch what he's doing. But as you know, I'd pay the seminar fee and more just to hear him speak. <laughs> yeah just to yeah, yeah. talk and tell stories that's that's worth some more than the training i mean it's uh oh yeah it's it's amazing yeah it's amazing. yeah well just the people he's been connected to in the past you know it's like you know bruce lee is obviously the one that kind of comes to everybody's mind but yeah. you know that that was one of many amazing mm-hmm. people you know it's like you think you know this he talks about being coached by a 90 year old Amos Alonzo Stagg when he was playing football. And it's like, oh my God, this is the guy who practically invented American football. Correct. So the yeah. fact that this was one of his coaches, it's just amazing. And he was talking about his um, fencing coach, Faulkner, the other day. And one of my friends in class who had done fencing, he goes, oh my God, he learned from Faulkner. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's what he says. He goes, that's like a fencing God. So it's just like, the different people and he's very modest like he he won't guru doesn't brag about anything you know no. like that and so sometimes when you find the people he's been connected to you're like holy crap okay that's really amazing yeah yeah that that is that is amazing at the academy um obviously you have your current students that train there and then you just mm-hmm. every every day or every random day you get a new person show up and and um do they come specifically for knowing Guru Dan is there, or maybe they're just like, I want to do martial arts. What's this class all about? I think it's a, a combination because, you know, we, if we look at the demographic of people doing martial arts now, say compared to when I started. Uh, so if you go back to the 1980s, it was generally people were seeking out something because they, they needed some self-protection or something. And they, they right. knew what they were getting into where now you have people that are, you know, for that as well, but they're also looking for some nice recreation, something to do right. that they might enjoy and that will keep them healthy. And we've had, you know, I would say the vast majority of people coming there know exactly who he is. That's what they're looking for. And they, they know why they're there. 
Okay. We've had people from the neighborhood literally just come in and going, hey, this place looks pretty cool. And they're like, yeah, I want to take some martial art. And then later on, they're kind of looking at the wall and they're listening. They're going, oh, my God. OK, now I know who this guy yeah. is. But they didn't know coming in. Those walls <laughs> are amazing. And if no, one, if yep. anyone's watching this hasn't been there, when I was there, I got there. I told this same story on your podcast, but I'll tell it again. I got there really early one day. And the lady at the front desk said class is not for like an hour. And so I'm like, can I just look around? And she's like, yeah, go ahead. And I looked at every single picture, every certificate, every award. Yeah. It is just like I walked around that gym probably eight or nine times just Damn. trying to absorb it all. So you need to come back. We He put up a whole really cool section on Filipino boxers uh, since 2012. Oh, yeah. yeah. It is like really cool. Like I'm taking notes back there because I, I know when I get rolling like with this magazine, I'm like, I got to do a whole series on this whole Filipino boxing oh, and the amazing. history of it. There's yeah. um, so many famous people, of course, that train with Guru Dan and uh, the Filipino martial arts and train with him. Mm -hmm. I noticed there's so many over the years, there's been so many, I, I, I consider them famous instructors that have went off to do their own thing maybe train, mm -hmm. like produce their own videos and do their own things. And there seems to be, there's so many of them out there that are well-known. And um, you just like sticking to the academy, training, doing what you do? Uh, for me right now, I mean, I, I live so close to it. Right. So, yeah. So it's, it's kind of my spot. Um, but I, uh, it's funny you mentioned this, it, back in uh, 2019, basically, Guru and Simu Pala and Simu Cookie basically kind of said, you need to write your own curriculum now and start ranking people under you and making right. your own instructors. And I was a little bit hesitant about that. And they're like, no, no. And it was funny. It was Cookie was telling me. And all of a sudden, Guru just kind of comes walking in the office. He goes, that way you can. I'm like, wait, is this like an intervention? Like, is he out there listening? <laughs> What's going on? So it's kind of funny. And, you know, I talked to him. A few times I'm like, look, I don't really have the ego to say I want to name something after me. And blah, blah. he goes, he goes, look, Paul Wienak didn't name it after himself. He said, neither did Burton Richardson. I'm like, okay, fine, fine, okay, great. Yeah. And so, you know, they through their very loving nudging, I've I've done that. And I've got some uh students that uh especially these two kids that train with me. Uh, they've done really well. They've kind of come up through. I've promoted them to instructor. They've also got the instructorship on the guru now as well. And um, so I've got some, you know, some clients that are, that are doing that. Uh, my curriculum, which is not, you know, it's not like it's astronomically different from, from this, but, but basically the way guru said, he said that way you can teach everything that you've learned from Larry and me. And he's like from Kathy Long when she was here and Omri Bond and, Sia it's wind, about carrying it way. on. Like, you have to carry on. Someone yeah, has to exactly. carry on the tradition for many, exactly. many, many years down the road. And your young students will eventually, hopefully, carry that on too. That it's yeah. the only way it'll survive. It won't exactly. survive when people are fighting and bickering and arguing about. And all yeah, that yeah. Stuff. It's just I mean, that doesn't it, that it, that just locks people in place. It doesn't really promote no. anything. It doesn't really help anybody. Yeah, but. Yeah, so yeah, I'm I'm actually looking to start getting out and, and doing that. Uh, you know, get out and maybe do workshops, seminars, that sort of stuff too. Sure. Um, even maybe even do it through the Zoom media uh, with people far away if they want me to do you know, right. like basically zoom in and and do a workshop with their group or something like that. Yeah, so you have the time. Yeah, eventually I think I'm going to start heading that way. Ah, good do, for doing you. that good kind of you. stuff. Yeah. Just a couple quick questions. And again, I all right. So many other questions, but I'm gonna save for another <laughs> time just about, you know, about Jin Fan Gung Fu and Jeet Kune Do and the difference, the names, the terms. But we'll get to all that some other time. Um, okay. the question I've been asking everybody, and it's coming your way too, really quick though. <laughs> you know what I'm gonna ask? What's this silly argument between original G Kundo and G Kundo concepts? <laughs> uh well, it's Give me a your silly opinion. argument. Yeah, it's a silly argument for sure. So I, I'm, God, I don't even know. I'm not sure what motivates the other, other than how it was put was the idea of that somehow Bruce Lee's art is disappearing because right. people are training all these other things. I, I don't think that's true, and I, I'm not sure why and who thought that and and why and 
I, I'm sorry that they felt that way. I really am because it's really caused uh, some hard feelings from one side of it. Um, mm-hmm. The other side doesn't really care. No, uh, they're just training. <laughs> they're just training. I mean, it's like we do all that material that they do uh, as far as like original, right? right? So I'm clearly in the concepts group. Um, concepts, this idea came from Guru saying, look, we're going to to plug in the way we, tr- the methodology we use for JKD, we're now going to plug into these other things we do because it's we are not saying, okay, here's a bunch of uh, Muay Thai and now it's JKD. Well, don't you think Ajahn Chai would get pissed off at us if we did that? If we were literally, you know, doing what we get accused of? I think the C-Lot people would get pissed off at it. Right. I think the jujitsu people would be mad. So it's a very dumb argument because they don't take into consideration that everyone else, these arts that we're doing, that we clearly give credit to and say we are doing, if we were calling them JKD, I think all those people would get angry too, and they don't because they know what we're doing. Right. So if you look at the way Guru does Silat, he has really applied the concept of the methodology of JKD to it. He said, we need this to work against modern day fighting methods. So that's why it isn't standing and doing what looks like a traditional karate punch. It is on a Muay Thai platform. We right. have to be able to do our silat against a Muay Thai person, which is how people are fighting now. Right. Yeah. You know? So yeah. that's that's the application. That's the way he did um, Filipino martial arts. You know, what he teaches us is a product of what he told me now is about 50 systems. You know, 36 officially, he said, but it's more like 50 in reality. Right. And... It is the fact that, you know, if you go back and you, you take a really, let's say, a really good system that we know works like uh, Villa Braille, because Villa Braille was a badass, you know, fighter. And then you start doing this Stoka Parada and all these, like, moves. I'm like, okay, this is cool, but I did this back in my karate days. And I get a little antsy about, can we just freaking swing and do, you know, <laughs> actually do the uh, numerado without it being all to these, you know, kind of more robotic movements. I mean, I get it for tradition but that is that is that system that is a villa braille system that is not how in a totality we do that like you'll see it's a lot more free so even the other arts that we do jkd concepts or the methodology of jkd was plugged into those things making them better and more practical for us in that art alone so that's what jkd concepts is jkd concepts is not a separate thing that goes take a little of this, take a little of that, take a little yeah. of this and call it JKD. Now, because I study some different things, if you put me in a confrontation, I might end up giving you a, what looks like a Muay Thai round kick after I've trapped your hand and, and given you a, a Bilgy since, you know, that's a popular thing in argument these days. I might yeah. give me an eye poke and then I may give you what looks like a Muay Thai round kick. I don't know. I'm reacting. Exactly. Uh, am I going to call? We know what happens. JKD? We've seen eye pokes in the UFC by accident. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's oh, but, geez, it's hard to maybe hard to do, but you've seen it. And, right. Uh, it stops you. They're setups. Yeah, yeah. The way I look at it, they're setups, and it's like honestly, when I'm done the fighting, I'm going to call what I did JKD, whether somebody likes it or not. To me, that's what's trained in there. That's it's right. coming out. It's an expression. It's filling. It's becoming water. It's filling in what needs to be filled in right there. Right. Yeah. So to me, that's JKD, and it, yeah, yeah, there's concepts to it. I don't know how you practice anything without a concept or do anything without a concept anyway. Exactly. So it's it's a semantic. I, I find it to be to just kind of answer your question. Um, I, I find it to be a ridiculous war of semantics. That's what I right. find it to be. I always looked at it from not that maybe that particular topic, but and again from being from the East Coast and only training at the academy, like visiting one time, but. Uh, Guru Dan loves all martial arts and he wants to research yeah. all martial arts. So you can yeah. follow him and do what he's doing or stick with one or two. It's up to you, but yeah, he's, of course he's living his path. And I know right. people like yourself or me and many, Oh, so many other instructors, they just want to learn everything as well. They just want to have a good time. Right, exactly. Today. So, yeah. Uh, my other question is with someone with no experience came to you and said, um, if I want to train, Jim Fan Gung Fu or Jeet Kune Do, 
what do you recommend as, for an instructor? Maybe not what type, yeah, like, oh, they're a good person and all this stuff. I mean, uh, I would like to train Oh, Jeet Kune Do. Uh, what's your recommendation? How to, how, what type of, how to shop for an instructor, yeah, essentially. yeah. Okay. Like, Well, criteria I think, what a good JKD instructor, if they're going to call themselves it wouldn't that, be, would yeah, it be. wouldn't be any different than I would recommend anybody just finding martial arts in general. You got to find an instructor that you gel with. Right. You know, I was lucky when I first started training JKD and Kali, Lauren, my teacher, like I said, was five years older than me. We got along like friends and we're still friends to this day. We're very close friends. So I think if you gel with your instructor, no matter what the relationship is, if it's someone that you look up to uh, and you admire, great. That's a good, you know, it's usually a good relationship. If there's someone that you're friends with, that's a good positive relationship as well. So you want that person whose teaching methodology fits with your personality as well. Right. So if you need the drill sergeant type, then that's what you want to go find. I'm not going to say whether that's good or bad. It may be right for you and it may be wrong for you, but you'll know that. So my best thought is go look for someone who is teaching JKD and see, first of all, if that personality matches what you desire that that you would want to spend time with and train then the other is watch the class see if it's material that you think you can do and would actually like to do and then at that point you know i'd also check credentials because there's probably That's my still big some question is like frauds lineage out is there very but important, correct? but um but yeah i mean there's a lot of lineages that are perfectly good and um you know i i wouldn't you know i i don't know how much like fraudulent stuff's going on in the United States Yeah. in that regard Yeah. I guess anymore. I mean um you get and yeah, there are a lot of lineages, and I'm not definitely discrediting any that follows a certain lineage, but Just the average person that's like, well, I did judo, karate, taekwondo, and Krav Maga. I'm going to call And it that's JKD. Jeet Kune Do. <laughs> Yeah. 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 So Yeah. I mean, that's, Uh, yeah. that's a little hokey. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a long discussion. And, and I, Yeah. I think, you know, for the person looking, Uh, the, that person generally, somebody says, I want to do JKD. They're probably looking for some connection to the Bruce Lee material. Right. Okay. So whether you want to do strictly just that material or you want to take the methodology and philosophy and start looking outward, that's up to you too. So again, if you're kind of into this thing where you say, I really only want to do exactly what Bruce Lee was doing, then you probably want to find someone that is, putting the moniker of original or JKD or whatever up. That's, that's what you want to do. Or if you can see the funny thing is you can do that in the Academy too. You could actually be an original JKD person here. It's called just go to the class on Monday night and the class on Wednesday night Okay. <laughs> that's actually and the class that's on that's Friday great night that you said that. and the class on Saturday. We Wow. have JKD class And in those classes, John Maidmont teaches the Mondays and Freddie Jin, who has been around since the Kali Academy, teaches Wednesday and Friday. And I teach Saturday and I know uh, I've watched John and I've watched Freddie and I know my class because I teach it. We teach that material from the Jun Fan, what we call a Jun Fan curriculum. So that is the material that Bruce Lee was doing. Right. And so that's there. And there were, I would say when I first came to the Academy, there were people who were strictly just doing that. Right. Now I would say the, the group that we, that I see here really are much more um, taking de several different things. We have some people that might be strictly just jujitsu. Um, but I would say most of our people are taking at least a couple of things. Yeah. And some of them are just like, I don't give a shit about JKD. They, they do like Muay Thai and BJJ or they'll Sure. do C-Lot and FMA or they're just C-Lot, you know? So it's like people, even And within you the have instructor. so many, you have so many schools in California around your area. Oh, Obviously, yeah. it's major hub for Brazilian jiu-jitsu. There's so many Of course. academies. Oh, Wow. yeah. Yeah. Wow. I could walk to... like three major Brazilian jiu-jitsu schools within 10 minutes of the academy. I mean, we've got like uh, Verdum is just like right around the corner. And then we have Hey Diego, just like 10 minutes, if that away. And he's phenomenal. Um, we've got, I'm trying to think who else is close by. 
I know there's lots. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, it's just like everybody. Everybody is, that's kind of what, a name. Uh, gonna... Again, real quick. Sorry. What's a typical day like for Guru Dan? Like, say a Tuesday or a Wednesday when he's just hanging out, or oh, what, what's a what's a typical day? Well, let's see. I'm not say, traveling you know, and teaching. <laughs> guru uh, gets up, gets himself some breakfast, and then um, you know, Guru's like what I really love about him is he's an avid reader. I mean, he's okay. always like reading and research stuff, even if it's not martial art related, like he and I would get in conversations because uh, he, he trains you know, with people like, and, and there were times where if he would travel to train with them, like say if it was GM Nene, we'd go to Griffith park to train with him. So I drive with him and he's always like, Timmy, have you read this book? Here's a great book on the Cherokees. And he'd give it to me <laughs> and he goes. And so I'm like, I better read this. Cause I know he wants to have a conversation about this. So, and I would do the same thing with him. I'm like, Hey, have you ever heard of this or that, you know, history? Cause he's a big history buff. Right. And so, so he, I'm, I know he's, he's always reading in, in any spare time that he has. Uh, he will be doing some of his own training. So, uh, and his interests will, you know, vary and go back and forth and come back to things like right now he's rediscovered interest in Savat. So he's oh, doing nice. uh, Savat training um, once a week. And then I believe he's still training with GM Nene, who's coming down to the academy now. So going to walk with him. Right. Um, then he, he has um, body workers. Uh, so he'll, he'll get like chiropractic and uh, massage, like body work stuff. And um, then he eats. Guru's a big foodie. So, you know, he likes <laughs> having his breakfast and his lunch. And, uh, and then he teaches. Um, okay. He teaches an awful lot too. So on Monday he'll teach in the morning, and then he'll teach uh, the kids' class in the evening, and then uh, an FMA class after that. Tuesday he will teach from five until ten. Uh, wow. So we have kids, That's Muay Thai, Sea Lot, yeah, um, FMA, and then JKD third level. So the, he only teaches the advanced level, uh, level three JKD. So that's his yeah. class on Tuesday with that. Uh, Wednesday, he will teach kids. Uh, well, actually, Professor Gary teaches Wednesday, but Guru assists it. So it's all jujitsu for the kids. But Guru's there for that. And if Gary isn't there, then Guru teaches it. Uh, and then that's it for him. That's actually Wednesday's his slow day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and then, then um, Thursday morning, he's got a class. And then Thursday evening from 5 until 9.30. Friday, he's teaching uh, 5 to 7.30 or 5 30 to 7 sorry wow. class and then saturday he's now teaching well it's funny he 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 assists me on saturday in saturday class <laughs> this is this you love this story ray so this is a funny <laughs> one so this was like back during covid he um you know his traveling got cut down right oh so sure. he would normally be gone saturdays so on saturday friday i don't know it was maybe thursday night or friday or something he says to me he goes timmy he goes, I, I want to come in and assist you on your Saturday kids class. I said, you want to assist me? He goes, yeah, yeah, if it's okay. And I'm thinking, what? Your name's on the building. Yeah. That okay would be a lot of pressure you? for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I think I I'm thinking, crumble under I'm thinking, pressure. Is, is he literally asking me permission? So I'm like, okay, I'm going to play this. I'm going to play this. So I said, hold on, Mr. Inosanto. Let me look at your resume here. <laughs> Says you assisted a guy by the name of Ed Parker, and you've assisted a guy by the name of Bruce Lee. Okay, I think you're fully qualified <laughs> to assist me That's in a great. kid's class. And so he got a good laugh out of that. So, um, no, I love it because he can come in then on Saturday. I can run the class, but he can actually watch the kids a bit more. Yeah. And he'll go in and, and get more one-on-one -on -one with them wow. since I'm running the class, which is really you're good. so lucky. So, Oh yeah. So he teaches that, or he assists me at that. So nine o'clock and then he'll take a break for about an hour, uh, 10 o'clock. And then at 11, he'll teach a uh, C lot. And at 12, he'll teach FMA. So he's teaching he's six on days the ghost, a week. nonstop. Yep. Yep. That's amazing. And uh, of yep. course, um, uh, you've attended, you've, uh, you've helped him on seminars a few times. Yeah, yeah. When Joel uh, was out for a little bit for a health issue, I did about, I want to say six weeks with him. Wow. Traveling. Yeah. Again, we, we'll spend another 40 minutes on this, but really give me the <laughs> quick version. Um, how, how is that? Like, obviously, 
I've always wanted to interview Joel, but I know he's probably not into that. Like he's I think <laughs> a very private person and I absolutely respect that. I have him on my phone. Once in a while, he'll text me, hey, remove this from the Guru Dan fan page. Or I'm like, whatever you say, sir, oh, yeah. do it. I will do it. And I'll do 20 push-ups right after you tell me. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, No, Joel's an awesome guy. And he's he's one of those, like, you know, he's got a very gruff exterior. And that's just his personality. But, yeah, if if he likes you and you get to know him, he's he's hilarious. He's an yeah. awesome guy. Uh, and he does. Like he does. Do, sorry an excellent job of, of his job, which is assisting guru because oh, yeah. the job is, it's funny. I was literally talking to guru about this uh, Thursday night. And then I was just kind of joking. I said, you know, people ask me if I'm your bodyguard. And I said, and I said, I laugh at that. I said, do you really think a guy of that skill level needs me? And I said, it's more like he's my bodyguard. And so, you know, we got to laugh out of that. And he goes, yeah, he goes, that is part of the job. He said, when you go, he goes, you know, it's kind of like bodyguard. He goes, and kind of like yeah. babysitter. And we're just kind of laughing. I said, yeah, I said, I don't necessarily need either one. I said, but realistically, it's more of a, because Guru's a nice person and mm. he obviously wants to give a lot of his time. So it's more like our job is more just like bad cop. Yeah. We get to say no so he doesn't have to. Well, that's why. Uh, because there's times, you know, he just needs something to eat. He needs to use the bathroom. And so it's just like, look, let the guy you well, know, yeah. have some time and space. People just try to, and I'm sure there's people that abuse the time too. Sign this, sign sure. this, sign that. And yeah. you get your sign this. And it, it's so much right. for him. I mean. It's, yeah. You know, yeah. And I would say for the most part, I think most people are really good and gracious. But, you know, you have to keep your eye out because it, there has been times when people try to get him to sign something that's a little like, no, don't sign that oh, group yeah, because it, sure. you know, um, yeah. you know, I've, we've caught a few, like there's a weird one. Uh, and I, I was a little disappointed in who it was and I don't want to mention the name, but they were trying to basically get him to sign some letter of authenticity for a particular tracksuit that they were saying was in game of death. Uh. And they were showing him photos and I don't know if they were trying to sell the thing or what. And I'm like, guru, that's not how that, you don't authenticate things this way. And I know you trust this person, but I, I said, you know, Paula needs to see this and yeah. <laughs> snagged it from the person and sent it to her. And she's like, Oh no, <laughs> don't you be signing that. <laughs> well, that's why on the Guru Dan fan page, I made a post about who I'm going to interview the person. That's the Jack Dalton of roadhouse. Oh yeah. I saw that. Account. I meant that's who I meant is you. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. And, and you know, reason, what's funny I, about that, is the actual connection because that that whole place was based on like a real bar in North Carolina. I think okay. that Larry was the Larry Hartzell was the head of security no there. Way. Yeah. And so there was That's you know crazy. some kind of rumor running around every once in a while that was loosely based on Larry, which is very possible. And I guess right. me being his student you know that's kind of an interesting yeah and then <laughs> the reason why i picked that well mostly for get people's interest like what's this all about yeah but i know that uh, you like other instructors you're always immediately defending guru dan you're there to protect him you're there to, right especially on social media i know you're very active on it uh you're always there to give it to the haters or give it to people that are right. what talking about basically you don't and like do dalton that. says be nice tell you be nice till you don't uh till you tell you what is it? Be nice until Oh until it's time not to be nice. To, to, yeah, something like Maybe, that. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, they the people the uh, people watching this, they'll type in the line. I know it. Oh yeah, I know for it. sure. It's, it's slipping that, that's my mind right now. But that, total respect. Yeah. Like, you're the person yeah. that and that's that's tell totally the it. right to their face. Look, guy. Right. What you're doing is BS. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Like we were nice, now it's time not to be nice. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay, and so, unfortunately, um, we just not had a lot of that. You know, uh, I'm actually quite surprised at the academy. We don't get a lot of, we get a lot less nonsense than I ever had thought. That's but nice. we do get some weird ones. Like the there was a guy that that cruised in during instructor camp right after the Quentin Tarantino film oh, was yeah, out with the Bruce yeah, Lee scene, yeah. right? And then so Guru had done an interview with Variety magazine, and I was there at the time and he did it over the phone and sometimes he has it on speaker and so that. And I think if he would have had it on speaker, I would have actually recognized the interviewer because uh, her name was Audrey, uh, Audrey Yap. And she's actually a producer that I'd worked with at E entertainment. I had cut some news packages for her. nice, nice girl. And she did a very good job of being very 
uh, exact to what Guru said. So she was very faithful to what he said, which was at the time he had not seen the film. And uh, they were kind of discussing uh, the Bruce Lee character talking about like killing Muhammad Ali or something like that. Yeah. And, and Guru was kind of saying, look, Bruce really uh, respected Muhammad Ali. And so it, it was actually a really um, good interview. And the lady, like I said, really faithfully uh, covered exactly what he said. And she did, she did a good job. And somehow there was, I, I don't know, basically, I think it was LA Times and Yahoo News, um, they were turned down for interviews. So basically they wanted to interview Guru too, but Paula said no. And so they, of course, based their stuff on the Variety interview and then made click, these clickbait headlines saying, oh, yeah. Bruce Lee protege slams the movie. He did not. You know, so it's great clickbait, but it's not true. And so this made people upset and the internet exploded. And weirdly, there was a instructor camp not long after that and this dude shows up and he's standing outside during camp and he had interacted with some of the instructors people and i thought well sometimes when people come in town they bring their families and their families go off and do stuff right and he was dressed up in a way that made me think he was an actor out giving out headshots and at the time at the end of the block there was a talent agency and i assumed he was maybe going to there or something and Cookie comes over and we had, I moved the camera up halfway up the mat because Guru was talking uh, back by the Wing Chun dummies and the stuff back there. So we were away from the garage door. So it was open, which is where this guy was. Cookie comes up and she says, Guru, this guy says his father does body work on you when you're in, in New York. And he goes, really? What's his name? She goes, I don't know. She goes back and I'm watching and I'm just, I can't hear him. Because I'm too far away. I'm like, this body language, I don't like it. Something's up. And I see Cookie getting a little agitated. And I'm like, yeah, I really don't like this body language. And all of a sudden, the guy just throws a sidekick. And he, he hits one of these cones that's standing up in the garage. If you know people have been there, they know what it is. And it's like, it wouldn't take much to knock one over. But he kicked it, and it just barely moved. And I'm like, what is this clown doing? What is this right. idiot doing? And she picks up her phone and takes a picture of it. And I can see she's pretty agitated with the guy. And he, in a huff, turns around, picks up his backpack. And when he turned the backpack around, there was like a big size Captain America shield on it. I'm like, what grown man is walking around with a Captain America shield on his bag? Wow. And he huffs off down the parking lot. She comes in. She goes, well, that guy just challenged Guru to a fight because he didn't like what he said in the interview. I said, what? <laughs> and she said, we just told him to get lost. And then we had LAPD come down. They picked him up and said he was a little loony. But right. it's just like, it's laughable going, are you seriously going to come in? You're going to try to challenge the instructor when this is instructor conference. There's like 50 instructor level people in this oh, room. Oh, yeah, for sure. Beat you, to death. <laughs> you moron. All like, of them that would you know, uh, fight to the death. Oh, my your dad. God. <laughs> it's just so dumb. But, you know, I, I generally do you know for the dalton thing that you're talking about i do position myself generally when you come in that door the main door of the academy i'm usually right back there in that corner so that way i can catch anyone coming in the open garage door or in that right. back door because okay. that's the only way is really in so if there's a problem i can be one of the first people that they encounter yeah. nice. <laughs> let's put it that nice. way <laughs> okay uh that's i'm gonna call it that was about an hour and 15 minutes. It was awesome. Wow. Just, okay. Um, Man, that went fast, buddy. I know. I know. I know. I know. We can chat for a few minutes when we turn this off. But uh, um, favorite well, martial right. art movies? My favorite martial art movies. Okay. Black Belt Jones, totally, because that was one of my favorite ones. Uh, obviously, first one I saw. Enter the Dragon. Love it. Um, first or second martial art movie I ever saw was called Dead... Uh, Bruce Lee's Deadly Kung Fu. So it was one of the Bruce Lee imitators. <laughs> yeah. Bruce Lai or something boss. like that. That was Bruce actually Lai. a really cool movie. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And uh, The Octagon, Chuck Norris. Oh, man, that was awesome. And uh, Revenge of the Ninja. I've seen that movie, no word of a lie, maybe 400 times. Me too. I Me loved too. it. I liked Enter the Ninja, <laughs> Revenge of the Ninja. Yeah, Ninja Three: The Domination was wow. Maybe the first scene in the golf course was pretty cool. Yeah, the yeah, rest of, the rest it was of garbage. it was just goofy. And yeah. after that, eh, most of Pray for Death and all this, they all yeah. kind of went down. But Enter the Ninja was cool. But Revenge of the yeah. Ninja, 
Man, it was so I just love that movie. <laughs> yep. It had the best music to it. Dun, da, da, dun, da, da, yeah. Dun, yeah. Show Kasuji. Real then, quick, uh, real um quick trivia. He did a movie with Jean-Claude Van Damme called Black Eagle. Black Eagle, yeah. Yeah. And when it came out <laughs> on VHS, Show Kasuji actually came to Nova Scotia to a video store. It's wow. called Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. It's, you know, we have like Halifax, Dartmouth. It's all one now, amalgamated. But anyway, it's yeah. probably about, uh, I'd say, half hour from where I lived. I didn't find out until two days later. No. And I still, if I think about it to this day, and this is in early 80s, whenever it came out, like really early yeah. 80s, like 81 or anyway. If I still think about it too much, I'll cry. Like, <laughs> oh man, I don't understand. You know, it's funny uh, because they, yeah, they did kind of a bad job of like promoting those guys because Don Wilson used to do the same thing too. He would go to video stores, and I got lucky. I went into one by accident, just looking for like oh. some stuff. And I'm like, he's sitting at the table. I'm like, holy shit, Don wow. Wilson. He goes, you must be a martial art guy because a lot of people <laughs> had no idea who he was. And yeah. so I sat like, there's a picture on my Facebook, I think, of me and him. And uh, uh, that that was where I met him. Uh, well, if you go on sat, YouTube, he talked to me for like a few minutes, yeah, like ten minutes, fifteen minutes. He was cool. I liked him. Yeah, cool that's guy. amazing. Not to get off topic, but if you go on YouTube and type in Show Kasuji and you kind of follow the different ones, there's recent videos of him going talking about the movie and showing the weapons that were in the movie Revenge. Oh, Revenge. nice. And I watched them on my lunch break at work, and I. Went right down the rabbit hole of all that stuff. Anyway, <laughs> it's great. But listen, I really appreciate your time. I have seafood, sure, buddy. Kevin Seaman coming up at some point. Oh, man, that's going to be a good one. I'm going to listen yeah. to that. Hey, uh, Kevin. David and Linda Hatch. And, oh, okay, another um, good one. Yeah, and I've ta I talk to Cookie quite often through Facebook, and but she's yeah. obviously in Australia, so it's... Yeah. it's Is uh, she going to do one for you? She said she would. Okay, okay. Then she, she knows said I'm she would, but my podcast then too. It's six thirty, Kevin. I need here. to get Kevin on mine. So it's it's That's twelve good. hours difference time zone. So yeah. we have to kind of work something out. But she did. You'll say, figure it out. Just stay up late. She'll be worth it. Oh, she's such a, <laughs> a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful person. Just anyway. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the recording and listen. Uh, just All right, so everyone. Know I really appreciate your time. I truly do. Oh, thanks, Ray. I had a great time. Awesome. And...